We'll get started in one minute uh, as our panelists come up. I will be the moderator for this one, so uh, preview for uh, what's to come. And uh, anyone who is at the food stations, quickly grab whatever you need and find your way back to the seat. And without further ado, please join me in welcoming our next panel on brown assets transition, a topic that is much awaited uh, and a very, very hearty one to have. So please join me in welcoming our panelists. Hello. 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 <laughs> it is so good to be on stage with such wonderful and diverse perspectives. We designed this panel so that we could really touch on a very, very important and kind of elephant in the room topic that, of course, no longer an elephant in the room since we're having it right now. Uh, we have uh, folks from every part of uh, kind of the ecosystem of sustainability. So uh, l let's just kick off with some introductions. Why don't we start with you, James? James Cotton, I'm an attorney at United Airlines, and my connection to this topic is, uh, with my work at United, is uh, closely tied to what I do with respect to uh, uh, board governance, uh, ESG disclosure, and since we are at a college, I was thinking about this for a second, I play RA to um, various uh, ESG groups coming together and a, a safe space to be able to talk about <laughs> ESG issues. I got a little bit of laughs there. <laughs> too good, too good. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Irina Tveklova. I am also an attorney. Um, I'm a partner at Wild Gottschall Mandras LLP in their energy private equity group in Houston, Texas. Um, you know, generally, as an energy group, we help our clients invest, develop, build, operate, buy and sell energy companies and energy assets. And my own background is in project development. So construction, key equipment supply, kind of getting the projects off the ground, uh, working on key offtake agreements with buyers for whatever the project is producing, like power purchase agreements or supply hydrogen supply agreements, for example. Um, I also do energy M&A, buying and selling energy company and assets, and some joint ventures and strategic partnerships. And all of that primarily in the renewables battery and what we're now calling energy transition and energy transformation space. And I'm excited to be here. And you know, I guess our connection is we recruit from, um, from mm -hmm. schools. And we hopefully, for the students here, you know, get them really excited about energy, because it's uh, really what you do here is really meaningful. And so excited to be here. All right, uh, my name is Tyson Smith. Uh, I'm also an attorney, I'm managing counsel of strategy and policy at Pacific Gas and Electric, which is our local utility here. Uh, my team is responsible for, among other things, our PG&E's generation assets. We have uh, the largest private hydroelectric fleet. We have a number of large solar facilities, a nuclear power plant, and a few gas plants. Uh, we also have a very large uh, contract energy supply portfolio, $50 billion or so worth. Uh, my team also does all of our, supports all of our policy work. Uh, so that's um, a renewable portfolio, climate compliance, um, reliability, uh, climate change disclosures, power content label, all, all of that sort of work, uh, along with um, a fair bit of our sort of strategic and special project work much of which is related to energy policy and climate and things like that. All right. Hi. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Nicole Sistrom. I'm the Chief Impact Officer at Galvanized Climate Solutions. So I am not a lawyer, I'm sad to say. Oh, no. What Hopefully you won't hold it against me. Um, what do I do? So Galvanize is a, we're a registered investment advisor fully focused on the climate transition. Um, we have strategies across a handful of asset classes. Um, I think probably the most relevant one for our discussion today is our public equity portfolio, where we do um, take on the brown to green uh, question head on. Um, maybe a little bit about my team. So I sit at the platform level. I lead, uh, privileged to lead an interdisciplinary team of folks across science and tech expertise, um, kind of market development expertise, policy expertise, and um, 
impact measurement and management. And so we all are, we're just like a little strike team that we work with all of our different investment teams to help them um, really accelerate uh, the, the attraction, both from a commercial perspective, but, but really as the way to uh, a climate impact perspective at, at each of their portfolio levels. So. Well, thank you. You guys are extremely capable of talking about this topic. I feel very underqualified. So let me play the uh, person who's not at all plugged into the brown asset industry and ask all of the dummy questions. Uh, but what I can say is the brown assets world is one that uh, is uh, the biggest focus right now and the one where a lot of opportunity really lies. So I want to just start our conversation by asking, starting with you, um, Nicole, on you know, what is it that you look for as an investor when you're looking at brown assets and buying a stake in these companies? Uh, it, you know, conversation with Colin really comes to my mind where he mentions that climate adaption is also important. And I, you know, I put that out to put some words in your mouth, but if you can tie that in a little bit, just what do you look for? Um, is it the technology? Is it the, uh, uh, the ability for the company to adapt to climate uh, scenarios? Or is it that its ability to completely transition out of the business that it's in into a very different one? What is it that you look for? Yeah, so um, when, uh, for our public equity strategy, we, uh, you know, one one portion of of the focus is is to invest in companies which are brown today that we think will become green. And so, part of you know the diligence there is kind of normal um, public equity diligence work, and and uh, but a, a really important piece of of all of that um, work that goes into you know sh should. Should we make this uh, this investment or not? Um, our team is really trying to assess the for for these brown companies, but really across the whole public equity portfolio. Like, what is the appetite of the company to start to transition, um, and and what a major um, portion of what we think drives that is the is the company's signals around. Oh, we see this is a way that we will make money. We see we yeah. if we see you know this transition is is a way that. Um, that we will uh, create value for our shareholders. And, and then we also are um, trying to think through as well, are there things that we can do as, as investors to, to partner with those companies and really help them make that transition and provide some of our climate um, expertise uh, to them uh, uh, to be really helpful instead of, you know, uh, <laughs> Uh, an activist investor that's coming to them and, and berating them for that they're doing the wrong thing. We want to help them do the right thing is what how we think about it. So you, you mentioned the point on um, willingness to transition. And I can imagine the word transition itself can, can mean different things. So kind of bringing in both um, James and Tyson, perhaps you can tell us what does it mean from a company standpoint to transition? What does that look like? And either you can kick it off. Sure. I mean, I, I can think of this from a couple of different perspectives, but I'll talk about PG&E as really, there's two parts of that. We're gas and electric. And from an electric side, we've really done, in large part, the transition has already occurred in large part. We have a, a huge renewable portfolio. We deliver upwards of 90%, over 100% uh, retail electric power to our customers that's greenhouse gas free each year. Um, and we, uh, the state is going to increasing amounts of renewable across the full grid in future years. So that is taking place. Um, we also supply natural gas to our customers that, uh, you know, that, that they're delivering. So that they're really, our customers are going to, to some degree, drive that transition as they transition off of gas. And so we're going to have to support that effort as we do so. At pg and &E, we're kind of uniquely positioned to be able to support that because as we gas customer transition to electricity, we're not losing a customer, we're gaining another or a larger electric customer. So for us, that is a, um, a transition that we can support very easily, and it's uh, from an economic perspective. We're not losing market share, we're not losing a customer, we're not afraid to make that transition. It is a matter of being prepared to make that transition at the right time 
and making the investments in the right place, not stranding capital in the gas business uh, and making investments that you're not going to earn a return, and being prepared and making investments in the electric business to support that transition that our customers need when they're ready to make that transition. So it's really about timing and being prepared and being, you know, looking ahead and seeing what people are going to do. And there, on that front, it's, it's, it's never ob obvious what you should do. There's, there's multiple signals you got to be looking for. There's obviously, in a state like California, there's really strong policy signals that are driven by the policymakers, by the regula regulators. So those are strong signals. But you've also got to look for the economic signals that are going to accelerate or, um, or slow that transition. And so you know, we make our investments, our large investments, made on big four and 10-year cycles and things like that. So uh, trying to be prepared for those, looking ahead and predicting, that's difficult, but that's what we are in the business to do. I think I'll, I'll take that question from a corporate governance perspective. And looking at it from that lens, I think what um, we, or what I would think that companies should try to do is to walk the talk, right? Um, investors, um, policymakers, they're, they're hearing a lot, of, lot coming from companies regarding what we're um, doing with respect to climate change. But um, they want to see that, that action. And I, and I think from that perspective, it's maybe three things that you know, uh, should be encouraged. And the, the, the panel right before this talked about um, just about all, all, all three. But the, the first is that incorporation of that uh, climate change strategy into your overall business strategy. Um, second is with respect to transparency, being able to uh, see in disclosure document on your on, in disclosure documents on your website how you're actually walking the walk, and then third is uh, accountability. You know, some of that goes with the the second one with uh, transparency, but um, there's other ways that you can show uh, accountability, and and we along with uh, a lot of other companies show accountability through. Um, and the incorporation of ESG climate metrics um, into our comp plan. Okay, I agree. I think that there's a lot of action that's uh, uh, being demanded to be seen. I do think companies are taking a lot of actions, but I guess I'm still trying to get a little bit more concrete about what is that? You know, what what does a transition really take? Um, you know, does uh, do, do you need to like? send in a whole training on your workforce and tell them what climate change is? What does it concretely really take? And this is a question maybe for you, Nicole. Um, you know, what do you see as companies really focused on kind of from the get-go when we say, uh, you know, it's time to transition. We're looking to help you transition. What is that? What are those first two or three tasks that they need to focus on? to get that going. And I'm trying to really simplify this when it's probably not that simple. <laughs> but I, I just curious to see if you can well, uh, help sure. us Well, sure, let there. me try. I, I guess maybe to help motivate like why this is important, um, most sort of renewable infrastructure is not owned by pure renewable companies, right? It's not driven by uh, most um, most renewable infrastructure is is actually co-owned or developed by uh, by firms that also have quite a large fossil fuel portfolio. Something like eighty percent of of emissions, um, corporate emissions, come from publicly listed companies. Like this is this is this isn't something that we can ignore. We it, we these are emissions which actually must be reduced if we're going to meet our climate goals. So. So, you know, there, there's a, there, some people, uh, you know, we can maybe debate it later, like, should you engage around company or not? I mean, I think, like, my personal position is it's silly to think we're going to get where we're, we need to go if we're not willing to engage brown companies at all. Um, I, I think the very, if, you, if you're talking about, like, <laughs> a really simplified version of, of what it takes, um, I mean, the very first thing to do is, is to, Try and measure your emissions, and and um, you know if if you don't have a, a I I don't 
if you don't have a, I'm, you, I'm gonna use the word accounting, meaning to count, not, not in a, like an accounting sense, but like, if you don't have a good accounting of where your emissions are coming from and sort of relative sizes of you know, emissions coming from this asset or that, that asset or this product line or that product line, you, you can't get started. So that's, that's really is the very first thing is, is to measure. Um, we believe you should then disclose that so that your investors, your stakeholders, um, your employees can hold you, help hold you accountable to, to the changes you're trying to make. I think those, those are the really the very first things. I, I do think a lot of companies that are, that are then going to start making a transition really do start to think about, well, what are, what are the different products or technologies that we might offer, um, you know, that are may hopefully leverage our legacy business, but, but are in a new, you know, that are aligned to that climate transition. That, that, um, and, and so you do need to be able to reduce <laughs> your emissions. And in some sense, some cases, that, that will mean eventually shutting down business lines and growing the business in a different direction. But, um, you know, I think how it looks for each company is really sort of individual to each company. Can I jump yeah. in? Yeah, for, please do. So, um, you know, just like um, Nicole was saying, there's many of ways to uh, skin a cat. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, and a lot of companies, I think they start with materiality assessments. Sure. But one, one of the things, and I, I wanted to jump in to, 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 to plug my company, um, I think where we started was looking at the things that, as, as a company, we were unique in, um, unique with doing, and could use our brand, our resources, our money, blah, 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 to having the, the, the greatest impact. And one of the areas that we uh, you know, did that in with respect to climate change was starting a fund that invests you know, in, in startups and, and other companies that can help us uh, with our climate plan or our reduction of our um, um, emissions. But also, if those companies are successful, they'll, they'll help out um, the whole entire aviation industry and, and beyond. So um, that's another way of, of, of thinking about, uh, you know, starting yeah. your- No, I think Irina, this is process. very naturally something you can chime in on, which is a lot of ways in which, uh, I, I guess, yeah, I'm having the same problem. Like, do we call it brown companies now? I think there's a little bit of a definitional misunderstanding of what brown means. So let's just for the conversation's purpose say brown companies and we'll deal with it later. So you know, from your perspective, as you're doing a lot of this deal making activity where you see buyers who are looking to uh, perhaps transition and uh, offset their emissions or innovate for certain technologies that currently do not exist that could help create a transition that's uh, sustainable for, for the company. Uh, what is it that uh, you're, you're seeing in the, the, the space that uh, buyers are looking for when they're making these kinds of deals? What's the What's the area of the transition that's the sexiest? Also, the most underrated. <laughs> <laughs> Putting you guys on the spot here. Um, yeah, no, no problem. I think um, if I may sort of sum up things in, in kind of three points as well. So um, I think transition could also be kind of like an interesting term. Not everybody likes that because it kind of makes one feel like someone is being left behind or, you know, businesses are being shut down necessarily. Or, but it's really about kind of transformation or addition. I talked about that a little bit earlier. So, um, you know, what we're seeing is sort of in three buckets, right? So you have your energy companies um, that are, first of all, looking to offset, um, offset their emissions, and they are investing in, you know, low-carbon lines, right? So you have your Total, right, that has large wind and solar portfolios. You have BP, right, that have large solar and battery storage portfolios that are now focused on hydrogen. You have Chevron, you have Exxon that are focusing on carbon capture and storage, right? So you have your kind of traditional, um, what you would think as oil and gas companies really expanding um, their business lines from a couple of perspectives, right? Either they're just investing in clean technologies or, um, you know, they're kind of doing um, what was mentioned before, which is kind of corporate venturing. They're investing in startups that... Um, could have technology that they can then use to just make their existing processes more efficient, more green. Um, you then have clean energy companies like Nixera, for example, who have a lot of solar, wind assets, 
and they're thinking, well, how can we, um, you know, they are understanding that the, there's going to be a growing power demand, right, from data centers, from reshoring manufacturing, from just like a general desire to um, electrify a lot of the sectors of the economy. So they are looking at green hydrogen, they are looking at renewable natural gas and sort of how they are able to um, provide their customers with cl more clean power. And then you have uh, just generally corporations, right? You have Google, you have Microsoft, you have Pepsi, you have Nike, um, you know, who are looking to kind of operate, uh, lower their emissions and operation, right? So they are entering in power pur corporate power purchase agreements where they're either buying directly clean power or they're buying power off the grid, but then they're buying renewable energy certificates to kind of offset um, the emissions from that. You have Google investing in geothermal. You have Microsoft uh, looking at powering their, their data centers with like next gen nuclear. So it's not just you know, energy companies um, that you know, do oil and gas. They're just focused on like how to make that process clean. They're also going to drive a lot of the change um, that's necessary because they have the ability to take the development risk um, the technology risk and, you know, in, in some of your questions you guys asked about challenges. And I would say in terms of kind of transformation, the challenges are technology risk, right? Some of this carbon capture storage, hydrogen has not been done on a big commercial scale yet. And so who can take that on? Um, maybe some private equity will, um, but I think um, we will see kind of in the short term uh, bigger energy companies who are not as sort of concerned about risks, um, sorry, not as concerned about um, levels of returns and are, you know, have the expertise, um, develop some of these kind of interesting projects. And then you have, uh, I bring up geothermal because of Galvanize, um, you know, the reason why it's sort of taken off recently is because they're using horizontal drilling from oil and gas to, towards that technology, right? So you can certainly have used the skill set of you know the existing kind of um, brown assets um, and bring that into the um, you know kind of the clean energy world. Yeah, on the on the challenges, and this is a question to bring you into the conversation a little bit, Tyson. I mean, there are uh, innovation is a very clear opportunity for brown asset transition. There's uh, you know it's it's a longer term opportunity. I don't think it has a payoff in the immediate mm -hmm. term and. Uh, but, you know, and this, uh, James, also for, for the airline world, getting uh, something as critical as your utilities or your transportation and, and flight, that requires a level of innovation and a, a scale, commercially speaking, that can be uh, viable almost from the get-go. So what, and I, I've, again, I'm just giving you guys the, the answers here, but um, <laughs> tell me a little bit about what what are the challenges that you're seeing, and uh, what is what can we realistically like paint us a realistic picture about brown as a transition? Well, so from a utility, uh, from as a utility, so I, I think of us as enablers for other people to be to make it the transition. So from small companies to larger companies, they're going to use our energy system to deliver their their energy needs, right? So the challenges we face are therefore the challenges that they're gonna face in trying to green their businesses. So those challenges are really threefold. Safety, so everyone's gotta be safe and reliable. You gotta have safe and reliable power or energy delivery system, whether that's your the legacy gas system or that's uh, uh, energy electricity system. We know the challenges California's had in that recently and the investment that we've had to make to address, frankly, the results of a changing climate. We're gonna have to face, you know, we see the bay out there, we see all this development close to the water, uh, climate change and the effect of uh, sea level rise. We're gonna have to adapt to that. The, there's gonna be a lot of investment related to that. So we can see that we're gonna have to make, uh, those are the challenges we're gonna have to face around safety and reliability to deal with that in the coming years. Um, so there's safety. There's also uh, the clean energy itself that we're gonna have to continue to develop. Well, you talked about uh, carbon capture. There's gonna have to be technological developments there. There's gonna have to be uh, more renewable development, but then there's gonna have to be technological development around the scale of renewable development and integrating um, intermittent renewable technologies onto a grid. 
We've had a huge build out of battery storage here in California in recent years. That's gonna continue, of course, um, but we're gonna have advanced geothermal, other technologies are gonna be coming, and the scale that we're gonna need to meet our electrification needs in the coming years is difficult to comprehend. Uh, the magnitude of the, our energy needs in the coming decades are um, tremendous, and that is a challenge that is kind of difficult to conceptualize. Um, and then third is uh, affordability, right? And so uh, you're not gonna be able to make these transitions if people can't afford to make them. And so for us, the challenge is to do all of those at the same time, and right, you gotta make it affordable so that people are willing to make those investments so that they're incentivized to do it and, uh, and that there's the right, uh, the right opportunity to make those changes. And again, that's from the small companies making the changes, from the, from the people who are feeding into the larger companies, to the individual consumer level, to the homes, to the small businesses, to the larger corporations. And so um, that's gonna have to be, that's a critical piece of it as well. And so doing all three of those at once is going to be a, uh, you know, a challenge of a generation for us to deal with, I'm afraid. And so, uh, um, so that's the challenge, I think. It's a, it's a it's big problem. It's pretty significant, it's a big challenge. I'd say. Uh, I, I do have a question that comes up, which is, it is no, it is no surprise that transitioning something like a brown asset is, again, a, a multi-stakeholder problem, uh, an issue that everyone has to be plugged into. Um, Nicole, this is a question for you, and I, and I want to transition into governance as a tool here because companies, quote unquote, transition all the time. You know, Facebook transitioned to Meta. You know, <laughs> let's just say, you know, so they change. They do different businesses. Things change all the time. Sure. Um, in the same way as needs change, so will so will some of these brown companies. They will have to change to meet the meet the moment. So, uh, it, and that conversation is not new. We've been talking about brown assets for a very long time. Sure. So, tell me where we are from your lens as an investor. Where are we in this journey of transitioning, and where are we? Uh, from a governance standpoint of uh, uh, enabling something like this, has there been enough done uh, to transition kind of the priorities of business and strategy of business to really see the outcomes of an adapted greener company? Uh, I don't think at certainly nowhere near the level we we need it to see. I mean, I think we're at we're at a we're at a moment where we're where there are a handful of companies that are out ahead and are looking forward and and are um, and are kind of moving towards the change. And uh, there are a lot of climate curious companies. And then I do think there's a whole bunch of companies that just like aren't aren't there yet. And 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 that's okay. Um, I, I think. The for those companies that are are um, are looking further ahead, I think those are those are the companies that again they they are starting to think through how to really embed this into their business in this in the way that you know the kind of the last panel talked about um, at length. Uh, thinking about how do you, you know, how do you get, okay, great, you've measured, now now how do you actually make a transition, like what is the plan for what you're going to do to transition, can you make that at a granular enough level that you can then push that down through the organization so it's not just, you know, a CSO over here, you know, standing, you know, sending out an email every week like we need to fix things, right, it, th that it actually gets kind of baked into people's responsibilities and and then a sort of even advance, like can you link that to people's con compensation long term, you know, the, the, for their incentives, um, and and uh, and really kind of putting in place that structure. I, I don't think that that's that's th this kind of dream that I'm selling right now is really that widespread. But there are companies that are that are moving in that direction, and and um, and certainly companies who, I think, in a lot of, I mean, the other thing to think about in the brown assets. Tr Brown asset spaces. You know, many of these brown assets are in hard to decarbonize sectors. <laughs> like, I, I mean, I think like United is a great example, right? Like, so much of the emissions come from the fuel that's used in the airplanes. Like, we just don't have that much. Th there's nothing to transition to. The SAF is like what do we sustainable do? aviation <laughs> fuel is. I, I, you, you probably know better than I. It's like 0.2 percent of all fuel it used. It is low. It's, you know, 
I don't I don't think I'm that far off. I mean, maybe it's a single percentage point, but it's it's low right now. And um, but but to but those companies that are starting to put in place um, plans and governance structures that then put pressure on the company to transition to do things like um, invest where they can or uh, t to start to be creative. I think we're, we are starting to see some movement there, but there's certainly a long way to go. Uh, James, this is a question for you to kind of build on what um, Nicole is saying about the governance structures. You kind of sit in a place where you both enable that and uh, get to see it happen. What is it, what, what tools, I guess, or what governance mechanisms do you find have been v very useful I mean, in the constraints of what's actually possible for United, considering that jet fuel has no commercially viable solution just yet, uh, but but I'm sure you're working on it. So what is that? What are those governance tools that uh, you've seen have a positive impact? And then just to tack on yet another question, uh, what are the governance challenges? Where do you feel like there's still a lot uh, of roadblocks to getting kind of a holistic business move towards uh, the transition? Um, well, probably the, it all starts with engagement. That's probably the, the, um, the biggest tool. Going out there off season, not connected to your annual meeting, um, speaking to um, institutional investors, speaking to other stakeholders who are interested in this topic and seeing what they have to say and actually taking that back to the board and to management and and having those leaders who hear it really take that seriously. So I think the, the first point is um, shareholder engagement and, and taking uh, what's uh, being said uh, seriously. Second is uh, setting up a structure with the board and with management so they have the proper oversight over um, your ESG, your, your, your climate strategy. So, um, you know, putting into uh, the charters of various committees um, what they're doing to uh, provide that, that proper oversight, maybe even going as far as creating a ESG or, or a climate um, uh, committee, if that makes sense for, for your company um, at the board level. And then um, at the management level, making sure that um, the, the top executives at your company have insight on what the ESG, what the climate um, leaders are doing and um, have proper oversight over those um, initiatives and are making sure that those, um, their um, tangible uh, goals and, those go and, and making sure that there's progress with respect to those goals. Um, third is you know, where all the sauce is made, <laughs> is making sure that those uh, ESG leaders, the, the climate leaders, are, are doing what they're, they're saying that they're doing. And um, there's also interaction with the, um, your sustainability group, with the other groups that are needed to be successful. So, um, you know, with all of these dis disclosure requirements, you're going to need controls to make sure that what you're disclosing is um, accurate and um, um, is uh, investment grade level. So you need to bring in your financial reporting group. You need to bring in internal audit uh, to make sure that that's going uh, um, going on and um, you know is is. Uh, it's, it's proper. You need um, folks like me, right? Um, with legal to, uh, I'll put a plug for myself and um, being employed, uh, to understand some of these um, very technical um, uh, rules that are coming out and, and proposed rules that are, are coming out. So um, there's various ways, um, of course, the, to go back to what I was saying, to uh, skin a cat, but uh, what we do at United and what a lot of companies do is that they have uh, ESG councils where, uh, and you can have it where it's just, uh, you know, the, the ESG leaders come with uh, the supporting groups like legal and internal audit and financial reporting and, and discuss mm -hmm. various issues, or you can have it how we have it where it's open to uh, various members of all these groups to come together and discuss uh, major issues and um, um, make sure that disclosures are, are, are being properly done. Irina, this is a question for you, kind of based on um, Tyson, or sorry, James, you were saying on, on disclosures. I think the conversation around disclosure rules 
looks different based on the industry you're in or the company that you are. Perhaps it's just a hindrance because you're already so sustainable that this is like such a floor. It could also be that disclosures are the first time you're encountering the question of what are my emissions. So um, as, as, uh, as a buyer, what, what kind of information or what kind of uh, opportunity does disclosure bring? Does this, is this something that comes up when you're acquiring a company and say, let me see what they, what they put on their annual report? Is this, an, an, is this something we need to care about? I hope the answer is yes. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, no, definitely. But I think um, it's also different kind of between private and public companies. But like in an M M a context, you absolutely um, are doing ESG diligence. And, um, you know, there are sort of many aspects that you are considering. You're, um, you know, requesting ESG policies. You're sort of um, requesting various um, information. But, you know, to make it a little bit, uh, I guess, more interesting um, is, you know, not just kind of in the brown assets, but even in uh, renewable assets, you could have ESG concerns, for example, on the supply chain side, right? So depending on who it is that you're acquiring, you might be really concerned with supply chain. Um, to give you guys an example, solar, um, a, lot of, um, um, a lot of supply chain uh, kind of products are coming from China. And a couple of years ago, there was a concern that um, there's a region of China that uses forced labor. And so there was some regulation passed where if, um, if certain materials um, are coming out from this particular region in China, it's a rebuttable presumption um, that forced labor was used, and so you, you know you can't import those materials. And that, um, first of all, from the project development standpoint, you know created um, extra you know kind of um, supply chain concerns. Uh, but in terms of as a buyer, you know you'd be looking at the suite of documents um, that a company is using to make sure that they are pushing down. Um, you know, your policies um, to, you know, if it's a developer, for example, to general contractor that's building your solar plan to tier one, tier two, and sort of how far can you go um, and control that. So that's just one example um, where, you know, not just on the brown asset side, but even on the, even on, you know, a clean project, you really are starting to think about the sort of full life cycle um, and kind of ESG, not just um, okay. Well, it's a solar plant, so it's so it's great. But you know, kind of looking at those concerns um, beyond that. So much of um, transition is dependent on deal activity and the acquisition of green or more innovative solutions to things that are uh, either going to offset the emissions or or actually help the actual transition itself. So um, your perspective is very valuable in that. Uh, this is a question for you, Tyson. Uh, you know, how has regulation uh, shown up for for PG&E in that, you know, does it actually lead to, um, wow, we did this great exercise and it helped us learn so much about our business and therefore it is now directly responsible for us thinking about climate as an impact. How, what, it, I'm clearly painting a very drastic picture here. But what is your reaction when I ask you that question? Sure. I mean, we're obviously a very highly regulated business. And uh, I mean, we do, I mean, I, I would think, think about it this way. So we do, we, do, do very, we do very rigorous looks driven by regulations at our climate risks and vulnerabilities. Um, and so, that, so it does drive us to do very fundamental looks on an asset by asset basis of our vulnerabilities to different types of risks, to wildfire, to sea level rise, to flooding, to you know, also natural hazards, earthquakes in California, for instance, um, uh, deforestation, things like that. So we do look at all of those and uh, we risk score them and we look at investments to address them. We look at risk spin deficiency. So, I mean, it's so, the regulations sort of ask us to do this at a high level, but then the, the work that we do really drives us to dig deeply into that. And, and so it becomes part of the fundamental work you do in running your business and it helps decide how you make investment decisions. And so, again, like so many things, the regulations set the, the kind of the, the driver and the aspirational aspect, but then the devil's in the details about how you go about implementing it and then making decisions around it. So regulations often set us down very particular paths. They're not often very deterministic of the outcomes, 
they're aspirational, and then it's often left up, left up to us on how to meet them, and that's very challenging to do. Sometimes you're creating lots of things from scratch very often. Uh, you bring me a, a great question comes to my mind, which is, you know, once you do that exercise and you disclose, what is it, what's the middle step that gets you from, okay, I have this information, okay, I've shared it with everybody, to now I'm going to act on this information and make sure that this data or say our GHG emissions start to reduce. What is required to go from we know this to we have now done this? Sure. I mean, so that's uh, as utility, you have uh, you figure out your business plans, your project plans, you develop the project, you do project engineering, you look at what would what kind of equipment you would need, you come up with a cost estimate to do that work. You figure out, all right, is this, this how much this work would cost? Is that good, efficient use of resources to do that work? Do we have the budget for that? You roll it up through your budget process and decide whether to execute on it. So that's how yeah. it traditionally works in a, a, an industry such as ours. I will say the challenge that we face is, historically, those kinds of decisions were made on three, uh, you know, so let's say you've got a 10-year plan. You look at this asset's got a 30-year life and, so, okay, so we'll plan 10 years out for to replace it and we'll start the work for it. Okay, now we're gonna layer on top of it some additional climate vulnerability and so we'll start looking at that five years out. But what we're realizing, what we see is that these risks are accelerating and as things get hotter, transformers fail faster and uh, you know wildfires occur and all of a sudden we're having to make these investment decisions uh, two years out that are not in our five-year capital forecast or our 10-year forecast. And it, is, uh, it makes it very difficult to plan. Like the, our budget cycles and the regulatory cycles don't align with the needs for investment we have to, that we have to make. And that is very challenging. And that's something that as a state and as an industry, we're all grappling with right now. And um, anyway, it's very challenging, and we're, we're figuring out how to do it. And of course, we'll, we're up for the challenge, but it's, uh, it's a cha it is a challenge. I, Nicole, curious to hear your investor perspective. I mean, uh, disclosures, um, I mean, honestly, Tyson, your response made me wonder, you know, this is not just a tick box, ex a tick box activity that we've been talking about kind of in the previous panels, but in some ways can have a useful impact may be aspirational, as you said. So, I mean, cur curious to hear your thoughts on that, Nicole. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think disclosure is sort of like, lays the table, right? Um, and, and the act of trying to get the data together, trying to do that analysis of, you know, that that uh, James was talking about earlier, like what, where, where are our sort of largest sources of emissions, you know, across scope one, scope two, scope three, what, what are the things that we can actually influence? Like, what can we afford to influence today? Like that, having disclosure is sort of like the, provides the foundation for you to start having those kinds of discussions. Um, and it's, you know, it's why I, we believe strongly that it, it, it's just sort of fundamental to getting this, <laughs> getting this transition moving. Um, and I, I guess maybe just to, to put it, but to like put a little spin on it, um, I, you know, one of the main um, criticisms of disclosure is like, we don't have the data. The data is not good enough. The data is not, you know, precise enough. The data is not accurate enough. And I, I think, uh, Rishwali said this earlier, you know, not letting the perfect be the enemy of the good. Like, I can't like underline that enough. Like, we have the technology to measure things most things to pretty good degree like enough to know is this important or not it, in it i think in most cases like we we can measure with that amount of precision and detail and and what is really critical as we affect try and affect this transition is to do it now to start now um and, and to not wait because you know heard it from Spencer, we're hearing it from Tyson, like things are accelerating quickly. And, and the longer you wait to try and start getting on top of this and start making this transition and start getting set up internally to, to you know, support all of this activity, it, the further and further behind you get every day. Like it, it, is, it, it is not, um, it's really important to just get going. Yeah. 
Yeah, and if I can uh, jump in on that, um, Nicole, I totally agree about the importance of disclosure and sort of that being the baseline. Um, but then I think you got to start to think about, okay, you're going to make changes, but who's going to pay that green premium, right? Um, at the end of the day, if you, you can even implement changes, there's technology, maybe not all at the commercial scale yet, um, but who is going to be paying extra? you know, for their flights, for their electricity at home. Um, because at the end of the day, in the short term, certain, you know, some of these technologies, not wind and solar, they've been around for a while now. And, you know, in some regions, they're cheaper um, than, you know, natural gas power. And, and so that's great. But for things like hydrogen or carbon capture and storage, you know, sort of who is going to, it's great to have that starting point. But then in terms of, you know, the middle steps, you introduce this technology, are your customers, going to be uh, willing to pay for that. And this is where I think it's very interesting to talk about not just the sticks, but the carrots. And things like the Inflation Reduction Act and sort of the incentives that need to come from the government um, to support some of these newer technologies. I think that that's very important. So you know you have um, various tax incentives for hydrogen, um, for CCS, for other technologies. And um, that really has supercharged the clean energy industry in the last couple of years. Um, for example, last year, um, in terms of new additions to the grid, um, new additions uh, of capacity with solar was number one. Um, this year, if everything kind of goes on time in terms of commercial development, uh, we'll see an increase in, I think, 89% in terms of battery storage capacity on the grid. Part of that is because IRA introduced standalone battery storage tax credits. Um, and so that there's, there's definitely very interesting um, kind of incentives uh, that are coming. Um, now, incentives um, could be sometimes hard to model around. You know, I think depending on who you are as an investor, you may um, feel uncomfortable that, you know, this project is only commercial because of government incentives. And sort of what happens uh, politically, if there's an election change, how that may impact you know, IRA or not necessarily the IRA because it's, you know, funny um, or ironic in some, some sense, but uh, a lot of the states that really benefit from it are red states. Um, Texas, number one for wind <laughs> and solar. You know, there are lots of manufacturing jobs in red states that yeah. have been impacted by the IRA. But uh, I think it's also very important to consider these kind of carrots and how they are impacting. And let, and, let yeah. me, yeah, I mean, Irina, you should just, Let's just switch seats. I mean, you, you can, you're <laughs> crushing all the topics I want to cover. Um, but let's actually talk about those different modalities. So uh, the, the brown asset transition, if you would, uh, there's a couple ways in which uh, we've seen it take place. There's the, uh, it's a complete business need. We have to do it. This is core to our ability to make money. Then there's the external pressures from investors, employees, communities, and, and, and government. And then there's these incentives, the carrots that you describe, where uh, uh, soft tweaks to the way we do business, to the way we flow capital, somehow uh, leads to these outcomes. And the way I've described it makes it sound like it's the best option. But I'm going to turn that question to all of you to say, of these modalities, and, and, and I know all of these, in, they work in tandem, but what have you found from your individual perspectives as uh, the most effective in seeing the changes that your individual uh, organizations really seek to. And maybe we can start with you, James. Um, things like IRA versus pressure from investors versus uh, just a sheer need for business. Which of these modalities have you found the most powerful in helping uh, United? Well, if I can, I'm going to um, not answer your question. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, and go off of what we were just talking as a way to answer it. Um, so I, I think, uh, and this is a big shout out to our, our chief sustainability officer, is not being afraid of your client base. So there's two tools if you go to United and try to book a flight that you'll see. One is um, there's the ability to see the um, carbon impact of your flight, your, the um, emissions. And then two is the ability to contribute to our fund. And, you know, if you're thinking about doing that, you're, you would say, you know, at some level, well, 
maybe we shouldn't do it, right? Because if we see that people, if people see that 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 emissions number, then demand may go down, right? Or you know, we'll see that people don't care about the fund and they're not contributing. And you know, it's the opposite, right? We haven't seen um, demand um, go down by uh, uh, supplying that information. And then the reverse, right? It's not a lot of money, but people are contributing to the fund. So I think that's maybe um, one thing, one big takeaway that I've I've gotten through this is not being afraid. Sure. I mean, I think that's an easy answer for me. I mean, as a regulated utility, the, all of our investments are approved by California Public Utilities Commission. They they tell us what to do. The regulations tell us what to do. We're they're driven by regulations primarily. We are early adopters of all sorts of technologies. I mean, I think I'd like to say the green clean energy economy was built on PG&E's balance sheet. We are the early adopters of large utility utility scale solar. Utility scale wind, battery storage, you know, we're the first people to do all of those uh, types of things. So um, and those are driven by regulatory requirements. And it's good to be part of that, right? And so we help create that, and then we're, we're leading in that still, right? And so uh, you know, that, that can work, and it does work. But we're also taking advantage of the tax credits to lower costs for our consumers later on as well, once those technologies have been proven to work, and 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 uh, you know, governments say, well, this is a good good use of taxpayer dollars to uh, build those out. So they all work. They're all important. They're all necessary. Um, but what's been most effective or most used by us is the yeah. the regulations yeah. and the regulatory drivers. Nicole, anything from you? I mean, you're you're you get to see an industry wide perspective in some ways from where you sit. What um, what have you seen as the effects of the IRA in in uh, has there been a slow or a fast pickup on that? Well, I just think in general, I mean, I guess what I would point out is um, the IRA is, the Inflation Reduction Act is the most consequential piece of, of climate and industrial policy um, in this country. Certainly in my lifetime, it a lot of, I'm shocked how many people don't know that, don't know about it, how, how important it is. Um, uh, so to, to the ex my well, I guess I'll just make a personal moral plea to the extent that you all work at businesses or, or firms where the IRA matters to the work you do. Please tell every single person you know about how important it is and 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 how it's driving down costs and helping to drive this transition. Th that being said, we if, if we zoom out even um, Europe has the Fit for Fifty Five, right? Like there there's we're in a sort of a new realm of law around um, and, and legislation around um, climate transition, uh, which I think is all wonderful and positive. Uh, I, when I think about the answer to your question, it's, it's, I can sort of rephrase it a little bit as like, is like the it's chicken and egg question. Is it policy that drives action or at the corporate level or, or not? And I actually think it's much, I mean, I think in the case of PG&E, as you said, it's pretty pretty darn obvious. <laughs> Regulation really matters there. But I think in a lot of other places, I, I, I think it's a little bit more circular, the relationship between policy and um, kind of corporate private sector action, right? Like policymakers, there's, there's, a, there's a relationship there where Corporates, you know, the private sector sort of shows what's possible so that policymakers are brave enough to make policy to drive it faster. And then that makes, you know, helps, you know, people start using the tax incentives so costs come down more so then the private sector can go a little farther and then and then the and then the policymakers are then able to take the next step. So I I really I think there's um it's so important to have both and and policy alone won't work. Um, consumer pressure doesn't work just by itself. Um, so I, I just, I feel really um, appreciative of that relationship. And, and I think that's one of the things that's so hard about the climate transition is to move things forward um, in, in, a, in the climate arena. We have to have all of these different uh, disciplines working together and, and getting aligned very rapidly to in order to make the transition on the time we need to make I it. I mean, you, you paint that circular upward ladder picture very well, but what happens when 
the administration changes, if it changes. Um, Irina, you mentioned that so much of the uh, benefits of the IRA are actually to southern states. Uh, a lot of the infrastructure, the factory jobs, the research, the grants, all of that are, are, are very largely impacting the, the red states, as you mentioned. Do you, how are you preparing um, either your clients or folks who are plugged into the IRA? Are they worried about uh, 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 the elections? Or is that affecting anything at all? Um, please bring us into to your day to day here. Uh, sure. Um, well, I'll I'll just speak from the conversations that I've had, which is, yes, clients do raise it. I don't think anyone thinks the IRA would be repealed. I think um, sort of more concerning is the fact that some of the key guidance around the IRA is not necessarily finalized yet, um, and so to the extent you know th the way the guidance is finalized is um, I'll give you. A quick example, hydrogen. Um, hydrogen um, has, um, there are various ways to make clean hydrogen, and there are many potential uses, which is why you may have heard, you know, talking about sexy topics, hydrogen is one of them. Um, <laughs> and so you could have blue hydrogen, which just means like hydrogen the way we make it now, which is from fossil fuels, mostly from natural gas, it's reformed, and there are a lot of, um, or, there are carbon emissions. Uh, but if you add carbon capture and storage, then you have blue hydrogen, so it's much cleaner. Or you can have high hydrogen from um, green hydrogen, which means hydrogen that's made um, using water and power. Basically, you have an electrolyzer, it separates, it captures the hydrogen, and then later on when you're using the hydrogen, it doesn't have any carbon emissions, so it's, it's really great, and, and you can store it, you can use it as energy storage, you can do many things with it. Um, and so sort of figuring out, uh, hydrogen has wide support across kind of the political spectrum, across the energy you know, spectrum, because of course traditional oil and gas companies can use natural gas to produce this blue hydrogen, and they get some incentives uh, for that under the IRA. And then you can have you know, clean, uh, you know, power developers are very excited because they, you know, that's just more power, clean power that could be used for green hydrogen. But there's a lot of debate about who gets the top level tax dollar for that. So to give you an example, gray hydrogen costs around a dollar to produce per kilogram, blue hydrogen around two, and then green hydrogen would cost five dollars or up. Just depends on where you are geographically. These are just general numbers. Um, and the IRA would give you three dollars uh, per kilogram of clean hydrogen produced. And those three dollars, uh, technology neutral, but they are dependent on your greenhouse gas emissions and the hydrogen production process, which basically means blue hydrogen doesn't qualify for it. Um, so there's a lot of debate, and I think, you know, the outcome of political elections could kind of have, a, have an impact about are we going to see a lot more blue hydrogen projects developed or, or green? Um, you know, so I think that there is going to be an impact I don't think IRA is going to be repealed. Um, and for things like hydrogen, uh, people are a little bit more on the sidelines. Like we don't see, we see a lot of talk about it. We see a lot of projects be announced. Very, very small number, less than 10% have reached FID, final investment decision, meaning where parties are actually committing capital to that project mm -hmm. and it's going to go ahead. Can I just stop you here one second? I mean, I, I, totally, I, I totally agree with your assessment. Like I don't think the IRA is like, getting totally repealed. There's things that uh, the uh, a Republican administration, which was hostile to the IRA, can for sure do to slow, slow it down or, or kind of like let certain aspects die or sh shave off tax credits. That's totally, um, totally the case. Also, in this country, so much of the policy which is relevant to brown assets is happening at the state level, and the states are forging ahead on, on clean energy for the, for the most part. Um, we're seeing so much progress, and, and as these kind of clean energy industries get built, then there's constituencies in these states. And, and so the IRA is important. It's not the only game in town. Like, thank goodness we've got, as a climate person, like, thank goodness we've got it. <laughs> really important can be extremely powerful, but there's there's the state the state levels, um, state level policy venues. Even in many places, like the sort of municipal level uh, policy venues, are are becoming even more important as we start to yeah. to really get into the nitty gritty of deploying. We things. have you know we're we're close to time, so I mean, Nicole, maybe you can just 
answer this question and we'll work backwards towards me. Uh, let's look into the future, maybe one or two years. What do you hope, what, what do you hope will take off? Whether that's a solution, whether that's a question, um, what, are, what should we hope that we resolve in about two years? Obviously, the answer you cannot say is that we resolve climate change because it's not <laughs> going to happen. Um, the, the, well, I, I mean, I think what I, what I, in like one to two years, what I would like to see is really just widespread measurement and disclosure and like a, really a strong movement towards that. And then maybe three to five years out, we have to actually see emissions coming down, like absolute emissions that we just, we need it. <laughs> oh, I think that's pretty valid. It's a tough one. Um, I mean, accelerated electrification, more electric cars. There you go. I think I, a great goal. <laughs> yeah. I think battery storage to sort of manage the intermittency. Um, electrification, I will put a tiny plug in for natural gas, even though I don't do any of that work, but I think going from coal to natural gas is much better. And if you can also make some of these carbon capture um, technologies work, that would be even great, even better. What I want to say, I can't say. <laughs> I, um, let, me, let me try to say it in a way that um, it's not in my mind right now, um, that, but that there's less, um, less disclosure rules out there. <laughs> well, uh, we can take <laughs> accurate streamlined disclosure. Yeah, yeah, this was a very, uh, very streamlined answers, all of you. Uh, please join me in thanking our panelists for I know it is a difficult discussion. <laughs> <laughs>